What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smartout Moment Smack Talk podcast. It's time for us to start breaking down TakeOver Chicago and Money in the Bank 2018. So we're going to start things off with NXT TakeOver Chicago, the people that are going to be talking for this edition. I am your host, as always, Tony Mango, and pretty much as always, we've got Callum Wiggins and Robert DeFelice. Hello. Hey, threw you guys yeah. off there by not giving you an extra second to say hi individually, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're now just, it's quite clear that we're the supporting cast now. <laughs> but I will tell you, it is the best of times. It's also the worst of times. I'm pretty sure there's well, a Well, no, that, that, that's money in the bank. Well, we'll get there, Tony. <laughs> you killed what I was going to do. Well, you know what? See, <laughs> this is the issue I've got going on here. You've got uh, some good stuff when it comes to money in the bank and some bad stuff. But I would also argue you got some good and some bad stuff when it comes to TakeOver. Normally, TakeOver events... Are pretty damn fucking good, but this card, there's really two matches that I'm interested in, and kind of like one in the middle, and then two that I'm not. Um, we might as well start on a on a optimistic side of things though. Ricochet versus Velveteen Dream. This is not only the match I'm most excited for; it's also got a really good chance of being match of the year based off of these two. The whole well, feud is based off of them trying to one-up each other, and they're essentially two of the most entertaining people that they've got. So you put them against each other, and even with Ricochet's potential injury that he's got right now, I'm still thinking this is going to kick some serious ass. Well, uh, not to rain on the parade, but during the media call today, Triple H did say that Ricochet... Had a little bit of a tweak. He's not fully injured, but they did take him off of the rest of the tour that they were doing so that he can rest up for a takeover. So he may be coming in a little less than 100%. Which, shouldn't this be another example of, hey, WWE, stop making everybody perform so much? Yes. Yeah, you'd assume so. I mean, they've just picked up 2.3 billion dollars or will do in the next in the near future so maybe they should calm down a little bit and when you've got a pay-per-view coming up maybe lessen the house show kind of schedule and ricochet that uh live event that he took place in there wasn't anything to do with anything it was just supplemental so don't have those people wrestle before a pay-per-view give them a little bit of time off you've got more than enough people that's the thing I'm sure whatever the event that they were doing, they could have thrown heavy machinery out there or something, you know? Throw out um, Chad Lale or people that aren't doing anything. Don't True, risk but, your pay-per-view people. But also in the same vein. I mean, I can understand like not it, but he could wrestle just one live event a week and still get an injury. It's like, it's it's the risk that yeah. comes with the, the job. I mean, you could wrestle no times that week and just be pulled like a Sami Zayn where he uh, went to raise his arm up and got injured. But the more you wrestle, the more likely it is that you're going to get injured. And you don't want to risk a... First off, like you built this whole feud up about the idea of them being able to put on a really good match. Now he's injured heading into this. If that fucks up the match, then you built this all up for nothing and you threw it away because you really needed to have him on that live event. Let me, let me just say, I don't think it will hamper the performance at all. I think Ricochet much in the vein of his great rival, Will Ospreay will give his all until he's dead. So I think it's still going to be a fantastic match. Maybe even match of the year. Actually, I take that back. WWE match of the year. Cause I will never see a better match this year than I saw on Saturday. <laughs> but uh, WWE match of the year, very possible. What do you think, um, Alan? you think it's going to actually affect it? No, no, I think Ricochet's worked hurt enough times in his career that he should be fine with it. It, um, it might take it down from being like a, a blockbuster classic into being something that is a really good foundation for a match further down the line when they both are completely healthy. But I think Ricochet's Modus operandi has always been still the show at any opportunity. And I think he sees a lot of potential with the matches with Velveteen Dream. I mean, I've heard reports from their house show matches and they've been 
getting like great reviews. So I can only expect they're going to pull out all the stops for this match. And yeah, I, I think one I wouldn't necessarily say that it might even be match of the night or even match of the year because I don't think it could be match of the night based on the card. Um, it'll be a very good match, I think. It's it's a definitely a good way to start off the show with a bang and set the pace really high going forward. Yeah, I definitely think it's going to be the opener. Just start it off with the match that technically there's nothing on the line. And even though it's potentially going to be the best match of the night, maybe not. I mean, there's still some other ones. I think that that's a good way to just set the pace, get everybody super amped up at the very beginning, and then unfortunately just nosedive with uh, the NXT Women's Championship match or the NXT Tag Team Championship match. Either one of these, I think, is just not going to live up to much. And I think the smarter option is to go with the tag team title match rather than the women's. But between those, I really don't think it matters all that much. And um, fuck it, let's talk about the tag team match. It's going to be... Whoa, 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 dude, we didn't even give our predictions. Oh, that's right, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Ricochet wins. Yeah, Ricochet wins. Ah, uh, fuck, Ricochet wins. Not that I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> I would rather the Velveteen Dream win, but Ricochet's got to win here, I think. Yeah, I'd prefer Ricochet to one-up Velveteen Dream almost every single spot, keeping in mind the idea that they sh- they should be pretty much even, but lean towards Ricochet a little bit here and there throughout the whole match, and then Velveteen Dream to get like some kind of like roll-up win, and just going to be like, ah, fuck you, I won anyway. I'd like to see that. Um, as I mentioned before, the NXT Tag Team Championship match, that is going to be the Undisputed Era, most likely Roderick Strong and Kyle O'Reilly versus... That's not most likely that is. They are the Tag Team Champions now. They're not even including Adam Cole in the mix anymore? Well, no, because Adam Cole is too busy being the North American Heavyweight Champion. Well, technically he still is a Tag Team Champion with the stable, though. I mean, so if they, they could, him, they, they could do it if they in, wanted to, but, but they're not going to. Spot. Yeah, um, they're facing the oh so legitimate team of the Brit and Bruisers that can't even be called that because only Mara and Alo and myself seem to like the idea of a tag team name, and they're not I'd all like, that I like useful. The idea of a tag team name. Uh, Oni Lorcan and Danny Birch, two people that just kind of just popped up. And clearly are not going to win this match. And this strikes me as the setup match. And when we hadn't had the tapings finished, I was totally uh, assuming that this feud was leading just to set up another match. Because... What we've had many times in the past, we've had instances where people have been like feuding with somebody on the weeks after a a takeover event. And then at that midway point before the next takeover, some other person steps in and replaces them on the feud. That actually happened with the women's championship match. We'll get to that in a little bit. So I was sitting there thinking to myself, oh, okay, we've got the Undisputed Era is clearly feuding with. Oni Lorcan and Danny Birch, but also Pete Dunne. More than likely, Oni Lorcan and Danny Birch will get their title match on NXT, and then that will lead into Pete Dunne and either Tyler Bate or Tyler Bate and Trent Seven against the Undisputed Era. And now they just kept the Lorcan and Birch thing, and Lorcan and Birch are not a legitimate tag team right now to me. They are two jobbers that are paired up because they fought each other a couple times. I like them to a certain extent, but this does not scream to me NXT TakeOver worthy. You guys agree? No. No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Callum, you go first. Um, It screams TakeOver worthy to me because once finally, after a considered absence, we're going to have a fantastic tag team championship match in a TakeOver show because these teams know how to wrestle really, really well. I mean, they had a six-man tag as the main event of one of the episodes of NXT, and I think that was the best NXT TV show 
like match I've seen all year so far. Just because, like, obviously they had Adam Cole and Pete Dunne as well, so that's going to add a little bit more flamboyance and excitement to the match. But only Lorcan and Danny Birch are wildly underrated, like immensely talented wrestlers. They might have been in job status beforehand, but now as a team, they've got a great a renewed focus. They've got something to be aspiring for. And Kyle O'Reilly and Roderick Strong, Roderick Strong in particular, has been on fire since he rejoined, well, he joined back up with his former Ring of Honor comrades. And he looks like he's happy. He looks like he's in a good position where he wants to be right now. And I think this match is a sleeper to steal the show. Um, I co-sign everything Callum just said. This tag team match is going to be the great wrestling match on the show. And I'm excited. See, I lose so much interest because I have no ability to buy into the idea that the title is going to change. No, I, I don't believe the title's going to change either. I mean, I don't think it's as clean cut as you do, and that's understandable. There's no reason for you to assume that it would change hands. But I'm, I'm more, I tend to just enjoy takeovers just for the match quality more than the actual results. I mean, this the tag team challenge hasn't meant as much since the days of like the revival and uh, American Alpha, so I don't get as invested into the story aspect of it. So I just kind of want a good match. And this is what I know I'll get that out of this one. See, I kind of look at it as similar to the Money in the Bank match that we've got with, then we'll get to that when we get to those uh, matches more. But the Good Brothers against the Bludgeon Brothers, I like the two tag teams, but I'm just going to go, all right, well, then I know that the tag title stays where it is. And you've already chunked out a good percentage of interest for me. It could be good. Like, Lorcan and Birch are entertaining in the ring. And the Undisputed Era, they know what they're doing. But, I don't know, it just seems like a, kind of like a stall to me. Like, it's almost, um, I guess, you know what, I'll jump ahead a little bit. Gargano Ciampa, to me, feels like they're just repeating things. Baszler versus Nikki Cross, to me, feels like they had no other option, and they're like, I don't know, that's good enough. And the tag team championship match is like, well, we don't have a whole lot of tag teams. Let's temporarily push Lurkin and Birch, even though we haven't given them any reason to be towards the top since then, because we probably don't have any other options. That's what this takeover kind of feels like to me. It's like almost like they shouldn't have a takeover right now, I guess. Well, we know that Tony just waking up is super grumpy, so... I've been, like, really um, burnt out on wrestling, too, and just not in the best mood, and uh, this actually, oddly enough, was the opinion I had when I wasn't as burnt out. Like, when I knew that this was the card a couple weeks ago, I was still like, really? That's it? Like, we're just getting Lurkin and Birch and Nikki Cross and... Okay. Well, like, isn't it just like indicative of I don't want to say like it's digging of resting fans like yourself or anything like that, but it's like NXT has set the bar so high with so many great shows in a row that you see a card like this and even like though there's a lot of good potential and there's good matches in there, just feels a little bit flat. But if you would put this onto these matches onto a WWE show for say now, like assume these were the card for Backlash or whatever, and you just say, Oh, this is gonna be so much better than what Backlash was doing. It's because WWE has that's, filled you with the expectation that NXT has in recent years. That's the one positive to take away from this is even though I'm kind of crapping on some of this, if there's going to be one of these two cards that ends up being a surprise and better than I thought it was going to be, it's going to be the NXT one. Like, they've proven me wrong in the past. Uh, there's been instances where I've been like, the revival really isn't all that good. And then they ended up being like fucking amazing. And now they suck again. Um, not every takeover is filled with every match being amazing. And we've had some takeover events in the past where it's been like, you know, this wasn't really the absolute best and stuff. But if something is going to prove me wrong, it's going to be takeover. And Lurkin and Birch, they are qualified in the ring like i'm not like crapping on them to to say that they're like terrible or anything like that they're not it's just that they didn't have much of a setup beforehand and to me this really struck me as like 
we don't know what to do with the Undisputed Era, and we don't have a lot of tag teams going on, and we don't want to go straight to the War Raiders, because maybe that's, like, Los Angeles or something like that. And, I don't know, it just feels a little weak to me. But then again, you ask me, who would you put in that position? Other than the UK uh, Mustache Mountain duo, or Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate, I really don't know, because they haven't done anything with the Street Profits. They haven't done anything with heavy machinery. More so, I think that the tag team division in NXT right now is just a little bit uh, unstable. You know what I mean? It's a little flat. It's a little lacking. Like TM61 just turned heel, but I mean, not to be more pessimistic again, but like TM61 sucks. They have no fucking personality. Yeah. And they need a personality transplant before they... They really, really do. And now they're the Mighty, which is like... Oh, uh, okay. Oh, are, they, are they just going by the Mighty? Yep. They That's rechristened the themselves the Mighty last week. Well, which, by the way, um, for people that are listening to this, we're recording this at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, so this episode of NXT hasn't come out yet, and I doubt that there's going to be any like changes, but... You know, just to keep that in mind, because uh, TM61 or the Mighty are supposed to appear tonight, potentially, and maybe they do something special. I don't know. I, I highly doubt it, but um, like it, the Mighty, they they aren't making me all that excited. And what other tag teams do we have? Well, they broke up uh, Tino and Riddick, and they're both injured anyway. <laughs> War Raiders, to me, are not impressive yet. They're just... Hey. Two dudes they're, that probably should be in like some heavy metal band. They're building them up in the same way they probably build up the Ascension when the Ascension were worth anything. Isn't one of them married or engaged to uh, mm-hmm. uh Sarah Logan. Tony's favorite? Yeah, <laughs> Sarah Logan. Yeah, uh, Raymond Rowe is. Yeah. Yeah. Good deal. Raymond Rowe. Um, it's like trying so hard to be Roman Reigns. <laughs> right. I think. I think. I think they'll be good eventually. I mean, obviously then. They're going to be a team further down the line, but once they actually get to have some matches with some strong teams, then we'll get to see their full potential. Strong I mean, teams like any... Undisputed Era? Yeah, strong <laughs> team, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell which ones are tired, isn't they? <laughs> On the panel. Yeah. But in terms of the match, I'm going to go with the Undisputed Era to win. Um, well, I don't think it's a given because you never know. I love the Undisputed Era and I think they win it in a very well wrestled match. I think it's a given. I would be incredibly shocked if more than anything, um, this is the, the second least likely outcome out of all the matches that I think are for both cards is if Undisputed Era were to lose. There's, um, some... Potential chance, of course, because there's always a chance, but I really can't see Lurkin and Birch holding that title. The most uh, surprising thing to me, though, out of all the cards that we've got going on, all the matches and stuff, would be if Nikki Cross beats Shayna Baszler for the NXT Women's Championship, because that is just a, a stall feud, if you can call anything a stall. Jaina Baszler did this whole thing with Dakota Kai, and this is what I was alluding to before, which was they normally do this kind of a setup where Shayna Baszler feuding with Dakota Kai for the first couple of weeks after a TakeOver event. She beats her on NXT, and then you move on to the bigger name for the pay-per-view. And this is the whole reason why Nikki Cross didn't come up for... Um, Sanity on SmackDown, which Sanity hasn't even shown up, and they don't even do the vignettes anymore, so that just kind of got thrown out. All because Shayna Baszler needed another opponent, and she's got Kyrie Sane in the pipeline, and she's got Candice LeRae in the pipeline, but really there aren't any other baby faces going on right now. She puts Dakota Kai out there, like, we're not going to do Dakota Kai. Vanessa Bourne is a heel, um, Aaliyah is nobody gives a shit about Aaliyah. Bianca Belair is a heel. Lacey Evans is a heel. And I can't imagine that they would book Shayna Baszler in a heel versus heel match. Do you agree, Callum? Um, 
no, you have she's the uber heel of the division if she goes up against. Even as much as I appreciate the work that Bianca Belair and Lacey Evans put in, if you put her into that match, you shouldn't devalue the other the strength of your other heels yep. by putting them in a match with Baszler. So I think that the way that they're doing this is this: they're going to do something more entertaining at Brooklyn and Los Angeles. And between those options, I mean, you've got Kyrie Sane and you've got Candice LeRae. Like, those are the two that you're going to do. Maybe... By the time the May Young Classic happens, we have another baby face that we can kind of throw in the mix too. But that's Los Angeles and afterward. Um, what's the one after Los Angeles? Phoenix. Uh, whichever one the Survivor Series has been held at. Yeah, that's Los Actually. Angeles. Oh, is that? Oh, uh, would be Brooklyn and then Brooklyn, uh, Los Angeles, and I. I think it's Phoenix is where the Royal Rumble is. All right. Um. Yeah. So. Yeah, probably that then. They so, usually do like five takeover shows a year, so it probably makes sense to put it there. Yeah, and given the circumstances of Shayna Baszler as champion, she's not dropping this title until... I mean, I don't even think she's dropping it at Brooklyn. No. I, th- I, I think, think Los I think, Angeles think, is the earliest. Yeah, I think she needs a, a long, substantial reign of the title. That's not to say I'm not looking forward to this match, though. I mean... I think this is going to be... It seems weird, because you're going to have Gargano and Ciampa on the show, so as a street fight, they're going to be quite aggressive with each other and along those lines. But Baszler versus Nikki Cross could be quite a wild brawl, because you've got Nikki Cross, who's completely unhinged and will do literally throw her body into anything to try and give herself the advantage in a match. And Baszler is more of a fighter than a wrestler. You can go that sort of sense of the word. She uses more of her mixed martial arts style thing and then will try and lock in the submission to take someone down. But up until that point, it's more just kicks, twist your arm, like try and break it if I can, try and damage any limb that you want to throw out there. So and I don't expect this to be a well-wrestled match, but I expect it to be quite a fun brawl. I really hope so, because I really don't want this to just be Shayna Baszler continues to stare at Nikki Cross, who makes, like, weird, crazy googly eyes over and over again, like their uh, their encounter last week. I don't want to see that. I have, like, um, an aversion to people playing the crazy character as somebody who laughs constantly, and that's it. Like, the whole point that they're crazy is just that they have, like, they're wide-eyed and they laugh. Nikki Cross, I don't know if I really like Nikki Cross. I haven't seen too much of her that really stood out to me as, like, bad. But I haven't really seen anything that really stood out to me as good, either. So, for her to carry this in, like, a story aspect to it, I'm leaning a little bit more towards I want Baszler to control the match. And then that means Nikki Cross can't be as crazy. And it's just sort of, I don't know. Like, I don't think that they're going to mesh that well. They could. They really could, potentially. Like, I don't want to throw out the potential that they could. Um, You have somebody who's like a fighter versus somebody who's more of like a scrappy brawler. And maybe that comes off really fun and stuff. But I think not being in a hardcore style match and maybe not necessarily Nikki Cross being able to play a good baby face is really going to hinder them. So I'm not really all that interested in this match. Again, especially because Baszler is going to retain. Like, there's no way Nikki Cross wins this title. I do think it's a foregone conclusion that Baszler retains, but I think you're vastly underselling the match. I think it could be very good at- I don't think the women, especially Nikki Cross, who's been a part of some of the better matches in the NXT women's division, I don't think she's going to allow herself to be out outshined by anyone on this card. And if this is her swan song in NXT, and spoiler alert, I do think it is, I think she's going to go out with a bang. Yeah, but she can't quite make that decision on her own. You can try your best and fail. And 
especially if it's like Ricochet and Velveteen Dream, Gargano Ciampa. If everybody wants to be the best match of the card, can't everybody be the best match? You know what I mean? Uh, well, I'll give you that. No, but I think it's going to exceed some people's low expectations for the match just because of how enthusiastic and aggressive Nikki can be. And I think that will mesh well with Shayna's more ca- cold and calculated aggression. This is a match between two. I mean, we may draw comparisons between like Asuka and Carmella in the fact that it's one real fighter against a character, like essentially just a model pretty much at this stage of the game. Again, th- this seems like a match between two actual legitimate fighters, people that you would buy as potential champions. I don't know. See, I, I don't think I'd buy Nikki Cross as being a champion. I think she's, in the recent episode of NXT, she's getting really positive reactions. So she might not be a traditional champion, but I think in the same vein as like a Nick Foley type character. Just yeah, someone she doesn't who's need bit... to have a range, but she can be champion, you know? Yeah, I think mm. she's, she, she, I think at the moment, obviously you could put Candice up there as well. I think she's the most popular baby face and I think it's the right choice to be. The challenger for against the the best heel in the company at the well, one of the best heels in the company at the moment. I'll also put out there. Keep in mind, everybody. I hope I'm wrong about that kind of stuff. Like, I don't want to be one of those people that's like I'm not really all that excited. And well, I fucking told you so. I want to enjoy everything. So <laughs> I hope I'm wrong. I hope that they have a killer match that it looks like Cross has a chance of winning. Baszler wins and looks so much better at the end of this and Nikki cross takes a lot of momentum and goes over to SmackDown. And, you know, I, I want to see that kind of a thing. And same thing with Lurkin and Birch. I really want them to like pull out all the stops and everything like that, but just not feeling it. And, um, that's okay too. Like, you know, I'm going to fucking love everything. Uh, so. it, it's, it's, I don't say it's always a good thing, but it's not a bad thing to go in with low expectations because then it's much easier for them to be. Exceeded. Yeah. Exactly. I'd rather go into it with low expectations and be proven wrong than to go in with high and be proven wrong. I will say, I think it was Chicago last year that was my uh, low expectations show because that was the one that had the Ruby Riot, Nikki Cross, Oscar three way, right? Oh, I have no idea offhand. Yeah, I think I think that was the one. Yeah. Yeah, because it was all, it was the match straight after um well the takeover straight after the WrestleMania one, which was Moon and Asuka. So yeah, there was a trip for it. Yeah, was that um, so... Hideo Itami in the main event too? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, Itami, Itami rude, gets yeah. rude. Yeah, yeah, I kind of remember that being an underwhelming. Thing. It was a forgettable one. It, it, the the saving grace of that show was the um, UK Championship match. That was that was match of the year. <laughs> one of them, yeah. Which that to me would have been like, well, they had a good match, but eh, what's the chances that they were going to have uh, an even better match or just as good? And then it was like, oh, okay, they did. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of like, thanks for putting on a fucking fantastic match, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't believe in you in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we're all going Baszler, right? Baszler. Yeah. Here's where uh, people are going to go, oh, Christ, Tony, you don't fucking like anything. The street fight between Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. No, no, no. Fundamentally, this match no, will that, kick some serious... Event. Why are we not talking about Aleister Black and Lars Sullivan? Because I think that it's not going to be the main event. I think that the street fight between Gargano and Ciampa, the reason why it's not going to be the main event is because we just did this match. And even though people go, well, they didn't have a street fight, they mostly they did. did. Yeah. They had no, an unsanctioned no, no. match. It's the same no DQ thing. Yeah, and well, I, I agree. I agree with you. I'll, I'll, I'll say I agree with you that it's probably not going to be the main event, but I've got a different reason which involves the finish. But we'll get onto it when we talk about the match in a little bit more detailed. Uh, the main reason that this match is just a street fight when they just had a street fight is because it was going to be last man standing, and WWE decided that AJ and Shinsuke should be last man standing. So you know, NXT is the third brand and had to take the bump. But Which I is think... dumb because AJ and Nakamura shouldn't even be a fucking thing. We'll get, we'll get to that when we get to that. But that to me is indicative of a big problem in WWE where the main event, main roster type people 
They drag shit out, and then they go, well, now that we're doing that, we have to fuck over something else. Because Gargano Ciampa in a Last Man Standing match, even though I don't like Last Man Standing matches, that makes a hell of a lot more sense than just a street fight. And that's just that's a shame that they took something that could have been a more logical scenario in NXT, and they removed that logic just because they had a different illogical thing that they wanted to do. I don't I don't like that at all. So to me, Gargano Ciampa, I'm not as excited this time as I was the last time. Keeping in mind, they kicked so much fucking ass the last time. So even though I think that this is just like, hell, they did a good job, let's do it again, and there's really nothing more to it than I don't know, repeat, then that's like blah to me, but shit, it's Gargano versus Ciampa. I'm going to fucking enjoy the match, you know what I mean? Like, It's like eating pizza two nights in a row. Yeah, I just ate it the night before, but it's still pizza. It's still amazing. That's a great analogy. And now I want pizza really badly, even though I've only been up for like 45 minutes. <laughs> Hashtag snack talk. Um, I think this match will steal the show. I don't think it's the only other one that comes close is Velveteen Dream and Ricochet and maybe the tag team match if I have my way. But I just think that this match has so much emotion to it because that's the one thing this match has that 90% of the rest of this card lacks is it's got emotion. It's got a build. It's got story. I think in order to try to separate it from the match they just had, both men will be wearing street clothes, like Punk and Jericho in 2012. But I think that Candice LeRae is going to play a huge role in the finish of this match. And I wouldn't be surprised if Ciampa wins because Candice got too involved got knocked out, Johnny got distracted, and we end up getting one more with these two in Brooklyn. We had an I quit match. Now, that being said, even though I wouldn't mind seeing that, I do think they want to move on to Johnny Gargano winning the belt in Brooklyn. So I think Gargano wins here, and Gargano and Loray go on to championship matches at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Now, Cal, let me tease us a little bit of uh, what you think's happening here. What All right, got? so um, I'll just say my piece in the fact that like, I'm looking forward to the match. Obviously, it's got Garner versus Ciampa. They're going to have a great match, probably the best match of the entire night. And even though it might be a bit more of just like a watered-down rehash of their previous one, I'm still going to enjoy it nevertheless. Um, I don't think Candice LeRae's getting involved in this match at all. I think... They've done a good job of separating her from the actual match itself. Are you sure? Have you seen the build? She's been I have seen the, I've, se- I've, I've seen the build, but the build has ended with her being out to like washing her hands for the entire thing. So I think there's a story to be told between Gargano and Candice LeRae going forward, but I don't think Candice is going to get involved in this match itself. I think who the person that's getting involved is EC3. Because mm. they because t- Johnny Gargano on a recent episode of NXT came out to announce that the match had been signed as a street fight right in the middle of an EC3 match, and I thought, well, what was the that seemed like a really weird thing to do? Like, what can you wait till after EC3 had won and then run out and do it? Because then it's like, okay, the distraction like it's not like you're trying to distract him or anything like that. You just got really excited and tried to steal his thunder, and EC3 didn't take too kindly to Gargano coming in essentially distracting people from his match that was going on and so i think the most logical thing to do is have ec3 cost johnny gargano this match you move on to an ec3 johnny gargano feud which starts to bring candice LeRae, who's been kind of away from uh johnny gargano and doesn't like the person that he's turning into you start bringing them back together because i'm really my biggest thing is i really hope this doesn't end with candice turning on johnny gargano well, they're because... not going to do that. They're legitimately married. They're not going to fucking... That doesn't stop their characters at the end of the day, but it's like, I, I don't want that... That 
doesn't work sit well with me with Candace's character. I don't really want the sort of like a guy versus girl, like um, not not the match itself, but like the idea of like a, ma- a husband and wife, legitimate a husband and wife, like feuding on screen. It just doesn't sit well with me. If and we think... had more babyface women in NXT right now, I would think that that would be a chance. But if they get rid of Candice LeRae, they literally only have Kyrie Sane left. Yeah. So, so, I think so. so I, yes, I wouldn't do that. And I think this, instead of what you suggested, Rob, which I feel something is a chance, but I personally think that instead of Gargano using this as a springboard to make him to get into a world championship match, this is the springboard to get Tommaso Ciampa into a championship match with Alistair Black. Well, that I can agree with, but even though a lot of people seem to be on board with the idea of EC3 interrupting, I'm thinking that maybe that was not necessarily something that was part of the plan, and I'm really kind of, um, maybe I'm overthinking this, I don't know. The way that we started this post-takeover, pre-takeover Chicago uh, feud, they started with Aleister Black essentially interacting with Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. And it wasn't until later into the tapings and stuff that they got a little bit into the Lars Sullivan kind of aspect. Part of me thinks that they originally had a plan that Chicago was going to be Aleister Black versus Tommaso Ciampa versus Johnny Gargano. And then they decided, fuck, we should probably do that for Brooklyn instead. And they were like, all right, well, then what do we do instead? Well, why don't we have Gargano and Ciampa in, like, some other kind of gimmick match? We'll figure it out. And then they went with Last Man Standing, and then they changed it. (laughs) And then they were like, well, we got to figure out somebody for Black to fight then. And instead of going with EC3, because I think that EC3 is going to be the guy who wins that title, then I think that they were like, well, we just got to go with Lars Sullivan. And it wouldn't uh, surprise me at all if Ciampa wins this match, and since Gargano had won their previous encounter, that Ciampa comes out and he's like, you know, I took out Johnny Gargano. That means that I should be next in line for the NXT championship. And Gargano attacks him at some point or whatever like that. And then it, whether it's two weeks, three weeks, five weeks down the line, we get the announcement of Aleister Black versus Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa. NXT championship, triple threat at Brooklyn. And that's how you go. If it's not going to go that route, EC3 gets involved, and we get EC3, Johnny Gargano, Aleister Black, Tommaso Ciampa. That is the only two, uh, like, those run parallel with each other, and it it's hard to say which one I think is more likely, because I kind of think that, like, you need to know what WWE has planned, kind of, to be able to say, oh, then, clearly, if one happens, then the other thing happens, but, you know. If EC3 does not pop up into this match at all, we're getting the triple threat. That's how I see it. I don't know if we get a triple threat. I think that if they were going to do a triple threat, it would have been smart to do it here. Either way, whether it's Ciampa or Gargano, I think we get a one-on-one. That being said, I am really keeping my mind open to that idea of there being an I Quit match in Brooklyn between Gargano and Ciampa, and Aleister Black can just fight EC3 or whoever. Would you guys be opposed to a Fatal 4-Way? I mean, we yeah. don't have the ability to make that judgment call anyway, but like, we can't be like, yeah, I like it, let's fucking book it. But that's also a chance, too. Maybe EC3 gets involved that way, and then it becomes a Fatal 4-Way instead. The only I would rather not. Done but... At a takeover was brilliant with uh zane breeze tyson kid and uh neville, neville. Devil, man. okay yes <laughs> neville. thank you uh, um yeah that was really really good so i wouldn't mind it as long as it's told the story's told correctly building up to that then i'd be fine with it but i think i i personally just prefer one-on-one matches at the moment but if it, a fatal four, it could be good as long as it's just not a case of like, oh, we've got to put EC3 somewhere and he needs to be in like a big match or whatever, and they've just forced him into it. That's why I would rather not go that uh, direction. Plus, well, I also think that EC3 versus Aleister Black is good enough on its own, and I think that EC3 is going to be the next champion. So I'd rather see that just happen in like Los Angeles. 
I'm really surprised that they're not doing the EC3 Cassiano match at Takeover because Cassiano is regularly used in that role of like, well, here's a guy we're trying to get over, put him in there with Cash at the Takeover, and it would be a good match. But they're choosing to do it on TV tonight, so I don't know. There's not a lot of space. Like Takeover is always restricted to five matches, so they keep a good formula. So... Yeah, Triple H actually said that that's exactly why they're not putting him on the card because, you know, there's only so much space and you just like UFC, you don't need to put every fighter on the card. Yeah, and Speaking I'm, of I'm fucking big... UFC, what's the mentality of let's have a bunch of fights and then take an hour off and just do fucking video packages? I'm like, God damn, this is making me want to watch the WWE pre-show bullshit. <laughs> Listen, there's a lot of things we can talk about that's like bullshit in the UFC that yeah. don't have too much time at the moment and way goes on to really like hold us to a leash, really. So <laughs> <laughs> to keep us hemmed back because we'd just be a load of guys that are predominantly WWE fans shitting on something we don't really know too much about. <laughs> that's true. Well, and plus, Tony and I did that on Monday. Yeah, fucking mm-hmm. UFC. Um, I'm going Ciampa here. I think that if he loses then this feud really doesn't need to continue because Gargano won twice. So you got to go the win at Ciampa. Yeah, I got Ciampa as well. Gun to my head, I'm going Gargano wins and Gargano and Candice live happily ever after. <laughs> he gets the final star. Bowser goes into the lava. <laughs> it's just <laughs> one of those kind so of things. So long, good Bowser. <laughs> Well, then we have the only match left is the NXT Championship match between Alistair Black and Lars Sullivan that we've mentioned before, and we all pretty much kind of uh, said <laughs> yeah. what we're, you know, we all are going with Alistair Black here. But um, I, I, I wouldn't I completely rule out you... the idea that Lars Sullivan would win. Like, there's a chance, but it, this is Alistair Black's first title defense. I highly doubt that that's going to be the case. Yeah, which is a shame because Sullivan... Like any beast, once they lose their first match, the the appeal is almost gone, and it'll be hard for him going forward. But, yeah, I don't see Lars Sullivan running here. Only because it's Black's first title defense. If they would have given, like, the Velveteen Dream a title defense, and then Lars Sullivan, I might have said Sullivan wins. Yeah, and- if this was happening at like brooklyn i would think there's more of a chance because just um back in april when we were talking about new orleans you were saying you thought lars sullivan would be the next champion and now yeah. that he's the first one getting the shot it's like oh i guess there's no chance in hell i mean just because nxt has a pattern of having their champions hold the titles for a long time doesn't mean that they would just like not have Alistair drop the title in the first defense if they really believe that Lars Sullivan is the guy to run with with the NXT Championship. I just don't think that Lars has that appeal. I mean, he's a really intimidating-looking guy. He's really powerful. I think he's better in the ring than a lot of people give him credit for. And I think he's learning like really like rapidly. And his entrance is amazing. I think it's one of the true like monsters entrances yes but i just don't think he's clicking and also i don't think that alistair black is clicking which is another issue as champion like he was clicking a lot beforehand but since he's become champion he's become somewhat of an afterthought just because of things like the chumper gargano if you taking up a lot of time you've got ec3 and ricochet just come into the fold so they're being given a lot of time war raiders as well and then you have the feud between uh, Baszler defending her championship and Baszler's feud with Nikki Cross and the Undisputed Era taking a lot of their time as well. Alistair Black's just kind of just been lost in the shuffle. So well, you need to give him a big performance and big win, I think, in this match. Well, let's not just make this I, you know, Black is winning, let's get on with it. I will say one thing that Lars Sullivan would be great for is being the monster champion for Gargano to top to topple. So if Sullivan can win, then I think even more that Gargano is winning in Brooklyn. And I lean more towards, I think that the direction, which I'm not basing this off of too much, is we get that triple threat, Black, Gargano, Ciampa, 
black retains in there. Um, maybe he pens Chiampa, whatever. And then maybe at a in Los Angeles, Black drops the title to EC3, and then EC3 fights say Ricochet in Phoenix, and drops the title to Gargano at the one before WrestleMania. Before WrestleMania, so Since whatever the one is the day before, yeah. The day before. Oh, you mean literally the day before? Yeah, the whatever the okay. takeover is before Mania. What's what's uh? Um, they're having that in um, Brooklyn it's again. It's New right? Jersey. It, it's New Jersey, bro. It's, or I no, guess but it's, uh, isn't it be... um? Isn't it another Brooklyn one? Didn't they say that it was going to be uh at the Barclays Center? They didn't yet. I don't think. At least that was like a rumor. I think that was going around. So. Which is like kind of confusing. It would be like Black retains over Gargano and Ciampa at Brooklyn, and then three events later, Gargano wins the title in Brooklyn, <laughs> like that kind of a thing. But I think that that's kind of what, where it goes, sort of. That would be Brooklyn be... Five at that point, wouldn't yeah. it? If they don't do Brooklyn again, they could do NXT Takeovers the Shore. That could be the name of the show if they decide <laughs> to go for a New Jersey thing instead. <laughs> Bring I wouldn't fucking Snooky it. back. Uh. Shut up, Tony. No. <laughs> What's but, uh, the but, uh, good looking one? Because I never watched that show. I, I, there's no way I would watch it. But uh, the situation, right? <laughs> no, the uh, there's there's like the Snooky's like the little troll, and then there's um there's like two that are like decent looking. One of them I always thought was like not as good looking as everybody else made her out to be, and the other one was like legit kind of hot. Guys, know which ones I'm talking about? I don't know. You think I watch that shit? <laughs> got better things to do. Got wrestling to watch. And to be fair, that's like over ten years ago. So I'm assuming none of them look good at any point. It might be. It might be one of the ones that turned up in TNA at one point, but I can't remember what her name was. I certainly wouldn't know him from TNA. <laughs> be like, oh, this one's like Becky or whatever, and be like, all right, well. Suddenly, they're the uh, NXT, or not the NXT. They're the Impact Women's Champion or something. That fucking yeah. terrible uh, Charmel match and everything. Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Uh, Alistair Black versus Larry Sullivan. I think that that's where we're going. I think that Black holds the title for EC3, who drops the Gargano, and that's why I wouldn't go with the Gargano and Lars Sullivan story because at the same time. If you're going to do Lars Sullivan is the monster that Gargano has to beat, I think Sullivan not only has to win here, but he has to then hold that championship for at least three takeover events. And I don't know if we've got three baby faces that would be good enough to fight him. Like, we've got Ricochet. And who else? You couldn't do, like, Sullivan versus Ono. Nobody would care. I would care. All right, one person would care. <laughs> yeah. Like, but that's not... Going, yeah, yeah, this great. Yeah, you couldn't when sell a takeover up, Los Angeles over, like, Lars Sullivan versus Cassius Ono. Nobody would buy it and do it, really. No. So, yeah, and... I'm going, I'd go black as well. On, on the strength of a lot of things going forward, black just makes the most sense champion. I'm betting on black. I was going to say that, Tony. God, duh. I'm also <laughs> betting on black. God, it's funny now. Uh, you should have gone with once you go black, you never go back. <laughs> Damn it! Ah. <laughs> once you are Sullivan, do you never <laughs> something again? <laughs> once you go yeah. Lars, you want to be a Mars. Yeah. <laughs> One shot for Sullivan and you'll never hear from him again. I don't know. I think this Alistair. is it. It, if Sullivan <laughs> doesn't win. If Sullivan doesn't win here, I think it's gonna be. I, I don't even know because he'll be like fed to Roman Reigns very soon. I'm running out raw. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, probably. Yeah, the big the big dogs <laughs> go away. <laughs> All right, well, um, that is TakeOver Chicago 2018, TakeOver Chicago 2, whatever they're going to call it. I think they're going with 2018, right? They're just going think. TakeOver Chicago. They're not even going 2018 or 2. Yeah, so Brooklyn's the only one that gets the little subtitles, I guess. But we've got our opinions out there. 
We need to know your opinions. Drop them in the comments section below on YouTube. If you're listening to this on iTunes and Stitcher, then drop them in the comments section of the page itself on Smart Cat Moment. And uh, anything else you guys want to put out about there about uh, TakeOver? Any like surprises or debuts you think might happen, like the tapings beforehand or something? I think uh, that keep an eye on the women's division. I think you might see uh, a Lacey Evans or a Kyrie Sam, even if it's just like real quick, just to kind of allude to the next Baszler title shot. And I don't know if there's any major uh, signings that might be there. The only one I could potentially see is if Io Shirai is in the audience. Mm. So that would, that would probably be it. I don't. I, don't, I think they try and save those ones for the, Brooklyn. um, for yeah, for your Brooklyns and your one before WrestleMania. That's usually where you see most of the the big names. Well, the next takeover is the one before SummerSlam, and that's going to happen after the May Young Classic. So they could put somebody out there like her and just be like, "Oh, look at that! She's in here, and she's going to be competing at the May Young Classic." Yes, yeah, so well, you might see um. Jessamyn Duke and Marina Shafir before either the title match, the tag title match, or the women's title match. Anybody think there's a chance Keith Lee pops up? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we might be able to miss him if he does. Yeah, he's a big boy. He's fat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also think that there's a chance that we maybe see some kind of crossover promotion with the UK tournament. You'd, ho- oh. you'd hope so. There might be some, a few bits pieces like. I assume Pete Dunn will be in the audience watching the tag title match, whatever, or watching doing backstage. That, doing that scowl that he does. Because yeah. he's perpetually like, ugh, somebody just farted. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's TakeOver, everybody. Um, thanks for listening to this. We are going to, uh, well, we're going to go right into recording our predictions for Money in the Bank 2018, but you might not click on that video. I don't know. I hope you do. And I hope that you like and share. I hope that you subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I hope you also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Smart Moment. You also follow these guys on their Twitter accounts. You can find that below. Anything else you guys want to toss out promotional-wise before we get to the next part? Um, WrestleZone.com. That's what I do during the day when I'm not doing stuff for Smart Out Moment. And Callum? Uh, let's save this money in the bank. It gives them a reason to click into the next video. To find out what I'm plugging. Yeah. <laughs> Callum's actually got something this time. Ever does he? Yeah, right, we we'll have to find out. Take over 2018 Chicago NXT WWE special event. I'm pulling a Yoda here. Um, yeah, I got, I got you. <laughs> thanks for listening, everybody. Click on that other part for our Money in the Bank stuff. We will see you there. This has been another Smart Cow moment. We're being temporarily counted out.